Hello everyone and welcome back to day 66 of Bitwise where we uh, make, I can't even remember the slogan anymore, I need to go and revisit it or just not say it. Anyway, uh, back into compiler rewriting. Um, I uh, unfortunately had a little bit of a, uh, of a minor injury, I guess you could say. I'm trying to get used to the proper kind of ergonomic setup at my, uh, at my streaming setup and uh, unfortunately I hurt myself a little bit so I'm trying to take it easy. I didn't code too much. Uh, in the last two days, I did I, I, and what I did mostly focused on compiler fixes. However, um, before the stream started for the last couple of hours, I managed to port most of the Lexer and right before I started recording, uh, we're just doing the final hookup of the top level dispatch. Um, so uh, be, be, before I uh, continue doing that, let me just say a few things that changed uh, architecturally since last stream. The other reason I didn't just jump in and start banging out code, aside from the fact that uh, my body hurts right now, is that um, I was not really happy with the architecture. So one thing I realized, uh, if you remember, I described this whole notion of the source database and stuff like that. Uh, all that stuff is necessary for the compiler as a whole. But I realized that the Lexer especially, like Lexer especially, also the parser actually, but especially the Lexer is really something that needs to be freestanding because it we will actually be calling on it in contexts where we want it to act as a basically a purely functional thing. In fact, I I decided to not even have it do interning, um, just to outsource that completely. So uh, in fact, it got so decoupled that it's quite a bit more decoupled than the original Lexer. Um, uh, and it has a bunch of, of additional benefits that I'll talk about, aside from just sort of, I guess you could say, cleanliness in a vague abstract sense. But um, if you look at um, the Lexer struct now, we we still have a cursor. The, this uh, stir used to be called stream. It used to be at global. Token is the current token. Uh, and then we have some initial state that is, uh, you set it up when you start lexing. And this is referenced later in order to calculate how far in the stream you are and so on. Um, and then there's some user data. So basically all the stuff we did before that was sort of hardwired is now callback based. And um, you're allowed to set all of these to null if you want. So if you set all of these to null, you get some kind of reasonable behavior. Um, and in fact, there's cases we will be using this because uh, I mentioned last stream that there's a bunch of cases where in order to have a compact way of referring to tokens, we don't want to store the token data in line. We just want to go and, and retokenize if we need that detailed information. Um, and in order to do that in a clean way, we need to have a way of, of, of using a lexer purely as a function, right? We just want to say, here's the buffer, here's the offset, give me the token. And uh, if you think about that use case, it really means that you don't want to have any kind of error generation uh, weird interning, like even if we've already interned the buffer and the interning is technically idempotent, um, that's a little bit weird. And in addition, it also, the other thing I realized that sort of, I, I guess you can say maybe as a consequence of that, is um, the, the ownership, if you want to be able to use a lexer in a freestanding capacity, the ownership of the name pool becomes an issue because you don't want the lexer to own the name pool. It really needs to be some kind of shared resource when you're using a lexer as part of a bigger compiler pipeline. So the lexer shouldn't be the owner. It should be the source base or something like that, some kind of outer object or manager or context. Um, but now when you start thinking about it in the context of like doing freestanding operations, like why would you couple it that tightly because then you have to know should I when I clean up the lecture should I clean up the name pool right and stuff like that and, and, and if that's the case what if I instantiate a lexer just to do some ad hoc parsing and then I want to tear it down? Should I? Who, what's the ownership semantics for that if it owns the name pool? And if it doesn't own the name pool, then I mean, it, it raises all sorts of questions. So I realized that uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to make all of this stuff be completely decoupled. So now what we have is we have a few functions that you can call. You can hook up these callbacks, basically, and they get called only you know for certain events. So for example, rather than assuming we have a source object, we just call online uh, when you see a line break and it says the position. Um, when you uh, there's these two other things which basically well this 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 thing called on name is used for. Um, interning essentially or rather what used to be interning um, and so the lexer no longer makes its own distinction between names and keywords 
uh, the way it previously did that was actually very thin. Like, for example, it didn't distinguish at the token kind level between if and else. It just classified them as keywords. And then you were supposed to sort of consult uh, some intern string pointers to figure out what kind of keyword it was. So I actually erased that distinction. Um, and I think that is the right call. There's maybe ways of bringing it back. Uh, that, that part of the design can can be reevaluated but at least for now given how things work um, that the way we were doing that before requires string interning uh, and so now the way it works is basically you're fully allowed to return null from this function and in fact if you don't set this callback to anything it will effectively return null like the wrapper um, the wrapper here, if it's uh, not set, will just return a null pointer. And what this means is that the token's name field will just get filled in with null. And what that means is you can't use the name field as an identifier or to tell whether it's a keyword. But of course, you can always go back and reparse the buffer in order to actually get the string value. And so this means that you don't actually, it's not a lossy representation because you can always go back and just look at the token in the string buffer. And if you want to do stir comp rather than interning, you can do that. So basically, this doesn't force uh, any choice of representation or uh, algorithm for how to manage that stuff. Uh, and then in terms of the keywords, the keywords are just in terms of the public interface to the keywords, it's just a big array. So there's a bunch of identifiers uh, and, and there's an array of things. And so if you want to do your own interning based recognition, you can just initialize your intern table with this and uh, do your own thing that way. So um, that's going to be how we do it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically the idea. And this is also how uh, stir buffers are handled. So for example, unstir is called anytime you see a string literal. So this is called with a temporary buffer. And if you want to allocate um, you know, a copy of that buffer in your string pool or whatever, uh, then you can do that and return a pointer to that uh, string pool uh, element. And then um, it will get stored into the token so that then the parser can get at it and the parser can pass it to the resolver and the resolver can pass it to the back end and the back end can actually, you know, do something with that string data. But you're also just allowed to say, okay, thanks. Thanks for telling me about this thing. Maybe I'm going to store it, but I'm not going to store a permanent copy. You know, I, I might just want to print it maybe if I'm debugging or something. Uh, or if an IDE, maybe I, I make my own copy, but it's not like an in-memory copy that I can hand you a pointer to. It's just I send it over the wire or whatever, right? Like uh, I have a copy somewhere else that you can't really access. So uh, this this allows for that. It, it means that there's very few invariants uh, required. You're allowed to just return null and everything is fine. Uh, you can recognize when it's null, right? When this field is null, you know it wasn't filled in. So then if you want to actually go look at what the data was, you have to go and retokenize from that position. So as long as you have the position, you can always everything is there for your for your uh, tokenization, retokenization. So what this also allows is, for example, suppose you want to do an extremely fast scanner that doesn't do any hash table lookups or anything else. Uh, actually, it it will do temporary uh, scope buffers for the um, string literals. So if you uh, and I should talk about this because this is something I added. Um, when you uh, when you parse a string literal, it basically makes a temp buffer that contains the escaped contents of the string literal, and this is you know it handles both multi-line strings and traditional C single-line strings, um, and uh, yeah, so it makes a temp buffer using stretchy buffs, and then hands that oh actually, and I can't do that. I have to do that afterwards. I can't tear down that scope yet. Um, so yeah, when I, I, I make this temp buffer and then I call this callback and it's given a chance to do whatever it needs to do and return a pointer that's going to be installed in this token, but it's allowed to return null if it doesn't want to do a permanent allocation or whatever, or, you know. Um, and let me talk a little bit about how this is handled. Uh, if you look at the original code, I think it just leaks. I mean, there's a lot of code in the original code base that intentionally leaks. Um, Again, some of that is actually fine for a um, for a batch compiler because one way to think about it is that for that kind of leakage, it's it's bounded in a very simple to understand way. Any, for example, any string literal you see uh, must be you know the, the escaped string buffer is a subset of the is a shorter version of whatever is in the literal uh, source file. 
So you can very easily prove for cases like this that the amount of leaked memory is a subset of uh, the actual source, the, the memory used to store the buffer itself. Uh, and so you can very easily bound the memory leakage. That's fine. Th that kind of thinking, by the way, is generally not, not a problem. Uh, I mean, it may be a little bit sloppy, but it's not a problem as long as you understand the implications of it in a batch program. If you're using a library, though, obviously leaking is not acceptable, never. Um, and since we're making a library now, it, we can't leak. We need to still have the ease of just allocating stuff without um, micromanaging the lifetime. And so if you look, yeah, let, let's look at what we did before. I think we just had a stretchy buff and maybe we, you know, we didn't free it. So yeah, I guess we just assigned, oh yeah, I guess we just sort of assigned ownership to the token, but I, I mean, this would probably be thrown away in most cases, right? So this would be a leak. Um, so the way we do it now is, um, there's new functions in STD, and I'll show you the user interface, and then I'll maybe show you the implementation. It's a version of what we've already seen. Um, you call new scope, and it returns to you an opaque handle. And the opaque handle, you shouldn't look at it, do anything with it. You should just pass it back to end scope after you're done. So you begin a new scope, and then you have this uh, thread local uh, allocator called scoped. And you can just refer to it in any context that accepts a uh, allocator. So you can use new, you can do new scoped, you could allocate some kind of, uh, you know, you could do something like this. Um, but you can also use it with stretchy buffs. And I think I didn't, this is something I added off stream. Uh, previously, there was a function called a init. The annoying thing about a init was it required, to it required an extra line of code in a lot of cases to turn code uh, that use default allocation to code that use custom allocation. Now it's um, it's very simple. Um, it's an expression. It infers the thing to allocate based on the expected type of the context in the same way that next does. Like for example, um, uh, I should mention this too. You can now do, uh, you can now do stuff like this. Um, you can do uninitialized heap allocations and uninitialized stack allocation using the undef keyword. So you can do p person equals undef. Previously, we always we, we still do default initialization to zeros, but you can do un, uh, you know undefined initialization, aka un, uh, uninitialized memory. You can do that with undef. This works for both new and uh, local variables. And if you use it for um, for heap allocations, then there's no longer a typed L value to infer the type from, and so it actually gets it from the expected context. So you can only use this when there's a definite expected value in the context. Uh, and in that same way, ANU is totally consistent with it. Um, and it's very convenient because, for example, if you wanted to do the uh, the, the default allocation version, right, with stretchy buffs, you just have it be, um, you should probably write it like this, actually. Um, I don't know if that will complain. Uh, oh, sorry, actually, let me. Implicitly typed, oh, of course. Um, okay, that actually works fine. Yeah, because I, I think I fixed all the cases where the new interpretation of, uh, you know, square, empty square brackets as a decayed pointer wasn't working. So this works now. Um, so when you write stuff like this, normally you would just write this, and this would be interpreted as a, um, you know, defaulted serial initialized thing. And the first time you do a push or whatever, it would allocate it on demand. Um, you can't. It, so the only thing you have to change to use a custom allocator is you replace that declaration with an assignment declaration, and you just write a new and then the allocator you want to use. And we have this nice name scoped, which is short and kind of descriptive, um, and it will simply allocate. You know, you you can establish scopes as widely or as narrowly as you want. In this case, in order to keep things a little bit tight, since maybe this is a potentially very big buffer, like you can have multi-line strings that might be very large. Uh, we actually include each of these uh, next stirs in an allocation scope. 
and uh, but you don't generally have to in many cases you'll see when we get to the parser uh, you can use you, you can and should use much broader scopes uh, both for efficiency and for coding cleanliness but anyway so you establish a scope and um, you don't need to do that before you do a new this is implicitly going to be whatever scope you're enclosed in if you don't establish your own local allocation scope uh, and then when you're done you do end scope now in this case the, the bug i just fixed before i explained all this is that i was passing uh, the buffer to unstir uh, uh, before uh, uh, after calling end scope that's obviously not what i'm supposed to do you should think of this as basically having stack lifetime, except that it's not allocated on the call stack, but on an implicit stack off to the side. Um, so this is a new thing. Um, let me quickly show you the implementation. I won't dwell on it because it's basically what we've already seen. And it's also not the permanent solution. It's just what I wrote in five minutes because I needed it. Uh, yeah, I even commented that. So right now what it basically is, is uh, every thread has a scoped allocator. It's just a version of the, um, the temp allocator I showed a few streams ago, um, except that it does default initialization. It has uh, when the first time you try to use it from a th given thread. Uh, the thing that's very sloppy right now is there's just a static buffer uh, in the TLS block <laughs> with one megabyte in size. This should be allocated, not statically. Um, maybe from the main thread you can do static allocation, but definitely not for other threads. So TLS has to be kept to a minimum for secondary threads because you often want their resource use, usage to be very minimal. But you can at least uh, do this as an on-demand heap allocation. Um, like, I mean, we can even do that. Let's, uh, let's actually do that. I think that's the right thing to do. So uh, you would do new, uh, Scoped buffer size undef scoped buffer size. Okay. So let me show you what this code does the first time you go through it. Is that failing? That all looks... Oh. This is size of a constant. That should probably be a warning, actually. Uh, I think I'm just treating it as whatever the R value type is, but that should clearly be a warning. Yep, and this is a megabyte apart. So if you uh, Okay, I guess that was already allocated. But anyway, you 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 grab a buffer, uh, and then this gets filled in. Um, and let me show you the end scope. The end scope basically. Don't know why the source info isn't up to date. Anyway, the end scope just resets the pointer. So it's essentially the alloc and free are essentially uh, the begin scope and end scope. The demarcate um, the allocation scope. They're essentially free, right? So that's the idea. And so that's how we're going to do a lot of this stuff, this kind of temporary buffer stuff where we don't know the size of the buffer in advance and we don't want to use static buffers, we don't want to use heap allocations. We just do this kind of thing. And you can see that it's extremely lightweight. Uh, and I will show you other tricks along these lines and also better implementations of, of the underlying internals, but the interface is basically this. Uh, you establish a scope and you don't have to do it yourself, actually. If you don't establish your own scope, at, 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 implicitly there's a top level scope that encloses main. Uh, and of course, when main exits, everything gets freed, but um, you generally want to have tighter scopes. 
Like for example, if you have a leaf function and it does a scoped allocation, you really should only use it in a context where you have a bounded scope. Like you kind of know that you've already established the scope by the time you call that function. So generally speaking, these sort of standalone leaf level functions that are just part of a general utility library should always establish their own scopes if they have to use the scoped allocator. But for internal functions where they're not intended for external calls, um, like for example, if I'm parsing an expression, I don't have to establish my own scope if I have to use a variable uh, size buffer using the scoped allocator to parse a parameter list or some other uh, variable length uh, argument uh, set of arguments. Uh, I can just uh, wait for uh, some, some, some something higher up the call stack that I know is always going to be there in order to establish a scope and close the scope when the call stack unwinds. But uh, in cases like this, it's a good idea to do it. We could have put the new scope end scope around the um, around the next function that would be fine too but then we would kind of pay a, a tiny tiny cost every time uh, any token goes through even though there's only one case that actually requires allocation so anyway that's the idea um, this is used in other cases too like for example uh, I mentioned that we now have callback based uh, message uh, info stuff so rather than just printing to you know standard out we uh, could do this callback and in order to implement that this is a standard problem you always run into uh, in order to implement that cleanly, you end up having to do potentially variable length allocation, right? Because uh, if you have to do SN printf, you don't know how big uh, the output is you're going to have to uh, print. And so if you use a static buffer, you either have buffer overruns or you have to truncate the output. If you use heap allocations, then who is responsible for managing? I mean, then you have to alloc and free it immediately. It's very slow. Um, so instead what we do in this function is we have a function here called stir f and the, the v is my convention i'm going to um, the actual normal function is called just stir f which is something we already had in our library so the normal function is called stir f you provide an allocator you're never allowed to call this without an allocator um, once we have optional and, and keyword parameters i will think about doing a version that defaults to doing um, I mean, that, that defaults to doing a, an allocation with a current heap. But I actually think that you should probably always have, most of the cases where I would ever use this function involve scoped allocation or um, maybe returning a, a string to a caller where you have local scope or you have what's called, what I call cyclic allocation where you have some kind of game loop or something. And so you can pass it back several frames on the stack, but uh, it's not like a permanent allocation. And so uh, I think for now, at least, I'm going to keep this allocator argument uh, explicit. The easiest way is to just pass scoped and it takes care of it. If you want to do a permanent allocation with it, you can just pass zero. That will always implicitly use the current global allocator. But uh, but that's the idea. So this is just for doing, you know, like if you, it, we used it extensively here. Like it's just for this kind of stuff. Like if, if you look at almost all of these cases where we were doing uh, this in the uh, generator, we only needed to return the um, the string one level up the stack like we needed to return a formatted string just so we could splice it in to a gen f um, in a case like this you can use the scope allocator you just don't establish a scope so there's an implicit contract that it will live until the enclosing scope ends and i won't establish my own scope so it's kind of like at the very least you can return it one level to your caller and he can in fact return it even further if he can guarantee based on knowledge of the code that the, the scope is broad enough to, to ensure the lifetime extends that far. But this covers so many cases, guys. Like uh, this, this really takes what, what is sort of standard scripting code where you can just call functions that allocate strings without worry and uh, makes it very, you know, makes it both fast from a computational perspective, but also fast to write, and you don't have to worry about the lifetimes very much. Um, so this kind of thing, if you haven't programmed with it, is a game changer, as simple as it is. So anyway, just wanted to say something about that, because that's a case where we were just leaking like a sieve, because there's no good way of handling it in C, um, I would say. You, or there's a way of handling it well in C, but it requires kind of global conventions and infrastructure. So technically, this is very trivial, but what makes it powerful is the idea that you have these sort of global conventions around how to do things uh, and things that are things are at your fingertips, right? Like every thread has a scoped allocator. It doesn't have to micromanage all that stuff. There's just the scoped uh, name and you just refer to it and you get your temp memory. Um, all right.
So yeah, so that's that's used currently for uh, these temp buffers for uh, formatted strings and then for the string literal uh, data itself after parsing. So anyway, um, that's kind of some, I would say some design changes from the original. Other than that, I'm just in the process of hooking up the top level dispatch and I will uh, continue doing that. So I just finished doing this before the stream started, so I haven't actually tested it uh, very much. Let's see if that does anything. Um, boom, boom, boom. Ent, ent, float. Okay, so it's at least recognizing the right types. Um, let's hook up other stuff. Okay, so this junk here is just going to turn into some case case ranges. Um, So yeah, so in this case, this is a case where we're not going to intern directly. We just call on name self. Um, what did we do? Did we go start? Right. So from start to here. So uh, I think what you just do is you do on name self start self stir minus start something like that. Um, and in the new system, we only have names. We don't recognize keyword versus identifier at this level of the lexer. We are probably going to offer an interface that has, you know, that just has a hard coded, like that doesn't do interning for everything, but just recognizes keywords specifically. So it's easy to offer that as sort of a bundle default when you want to make that distinction easily. Um, but basically, you wouldn't want to use that anyway, because once you're doing a more full compiler, you want to have integrated, you know, the, the same intern table for keywords and uh, and other things, and so, you know, you can just do that. You can just put all the keywords in and recognize them on your own. So that's kind of the split of responsibility that I decided on. Um, okay, so let's try this. Right. So. Um, I think I said last time that I'm not going to, I'm going to force myself to write uh, all the STD equivalents uh, of certain functions. Uh, use that as a forcing function that went out the window when I was trying to get this done the last three hours. So sorry about that, but uh, that will happen later. Okay, so what is the complaint here? No field named name, case block. Oh yeah, so we did like someone sarcastically pointed out <laughs> on uh, on Discord, one of one of maybe two warnings in the entire compiler, which I think is actually a good one because it's a trap for C programmers. Oh, I see. Yeah, so this should be S name, T name. All right. Uh, someone's asking about something like TCC's attribute cleanup to automatically vote destructorish functions when variables go out of scope. Well, I've, I've considered defer, and in fact, I had a simple homework assignment for people to implement defer back in whatever, week three or four. four. Um, so I've done go style defer, although a variant that only has lexical extent rather than dynamic extent. Um, so nothing that ties into exceptions or anything, but I'm still trying to avoid doing that. Like, I, I don't know. It's not that I don't like it, but uh, I'm trying to use, I, I've been working on other stuff that I think may be an extension and even better. Um, and so I'm going to force myself to not include it yet, even though it's very trivial to add, given that we already did it as homework. Um, so I'm, you know, my fallback for that stuff is go defer, uh, which we've already implemented. And, uh, but, but I'm hoping for a better sort of more systems level solution rather than just a local language solution for that problem. But let's see. Uh, where we end up. I'm still keeping that open. So, right, name. You can also see these line colon whatever. Those are not the line numbers. Those are the line positions. 
So it doesn't do any line tracking. It calls you back when there's a new line. If you want to do something with that information, that's up to you, but you don't have to. So uh, again, there will be convenience layers uh, on top of this that have uh, you know a line counter and a keyword recognizer and stuff like that for people who want it. Um, but this is just to keep the core streamlined and usable by all these different clients. Okay, so I think that worked. Um, I mean, I'm not testing it very thoroughly because I kind of believe the core stuff works and we'll do a big test once we have the rest of it moved over. Um, so yeah, these are a few of the special cases for um, for tokenization. So let's see. And then we're going to handle the stuff we were, like I think I described a stream or two ago, the stuff we handled originally with macros, we're just going to handle with inline functions. Um, actually, let me, let me <clears throat> copy all of this over and do it in one go. Ugh. By the way, I always do this intentionally, uh, even though obviously I could just do replace all, but I, in cases like this where it's not an overwhelming amount of code, I don't like doing replace all because it, it can always go awry and uh, it's always nice to just kind of quickly glance over stuff as it's being replaced. So I guess the other thing is token kind should be toke kind and token underscore should be toke underscore. Need to turn on case matching. Um, let me get rid of the bricks. As you can see, I mean, this matches my experience and I think the experience of most other people who've, who've tried. Um, you can you can very, almost exactly copy and paste code from C to Ion. It just gets a little bit shorter, right? Like t things get type inferred and stuff like that. And a few idioms are shorter, um, which is very nice. Um, I mean, it, it's not obviously like you don't optimize for copy and paste ability, but it's sort of a reflection of the fact that we tried to stay close when there wasn't a good reason to deviate. Right, so in this case, this is an example of something where we have to do online um, and we do it like this. It always has to be reported at the beginning of the new line. So you want um, you want the cursor to already be past it. You just do this. It figures out the position from its own internal state. Um, Hello, hello. Okay, um, yeah, so let's do these cases. Um, I think I showed you how we can do it. Um, these these cases are a little bit, <clears throat> I guess I would say awkward in the sense that they don't, well, they represent a specific, I wouldn't call it an ad hoc pattern, but they're kind of like a little fragment of a decision tree where you have certain shared prefixes and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm just going to call them case one and so on. Um, no, no, no shame in uh, sometimes in just fa factoring out code like this, even though it's fairly mindless. So um, let's see. Um, I mean, this, this is a little bit simple-minded code, I think, but let's just do it. Um, 
going to use vaguely better names. Um, oh yeah, and we have to uh, advance the cursor. Case two, we have We've already recognized the first character, so we have kind one and then char two and kind two to go along with it. So basically what you say is we always do this, and then if, uh, if this is char two, then um, let's do it like Let's say kind one, and then if this matches, then we assign kind two and we increment. I think that's it, right? Um, in case three, that is that same pattern, but now with an additional extension. So let's see. So we don't need C1. We need, yeah. Um, so I guess this is, oh, okay, so it's two alternatives, they're not nested. Um, oopsie daisy. Okay, this is kind of three. Okay, I'm gonna mark these inline. Um, this is a force inline keyword that will really force the compiler's hand. Um, I always, oops, that was not right. Oh man, the autocomplete in the Windows 10 start menu is, is probably the worst I've ever seen. It, it's, it's only matched and exceeded by the open file, the notorious quick open file that we've seen on stream before, which I don't know what it's doing. Uh, it's match ranking is truly atrocious. <laughs> um, the thing I wanted to show you is that um, in all my projects and also if you use my new project template generator and I would recommend this in general um, and you, you can get the equivalent on your compiler version in general I don't compile with optimizations and in, except for inline expansions should be set to only underscore underscore inline which is the equivalent of always inline um, any suitable is the setting on, on you know the highly optimized build the default debug setting on MSVC is disabled uh, the problem is code will be actually harder to debug and also the compiler nowadays actually has some support for treating nine functions as virtual call stacks as long as the code doesn't get um, subjected to code motion too much but basically both for performance and for debuggability you want these tiny leaf level functions to generally not be um, <clears throat> To, to be inline just so you can use F11 to step uh, step through and not step into every little tiny thing. That's one of the nightmares about stepping through t standard C++ code <coughs> is everything is inline based, excuse me. <coughs> and so it's impossible to see what's going on. It's almost, you know, like the fact that you can see everything is kind of overwhelming. So uh, that's one reason to do it, but also just for these things that are trying to replace macros, a force in line is exactly what a macro would be, so don't feel bad about it, but also don't overuse it. In general, you shouldn't have to do any markup. The compiler in, comp in optimized mode will always uh, will always consider inline possibilities and will generally ignore your your pleas for help unless you use a keyword like force in line, always in line, or whatever your compiler equivalent is. Anyway, so uh, with that, we should now be able to add all these cases. Um, Case one. I'm just going to copy them over for reference. 
Um, and so for us, well, I guess we already have this. Um, we might as well handle that under the same rubric. Um, so this is just going to be next case one token EOF. We're not, it's just going to be this. Um, I'm just going to copy and paste a bunch of these and just fill them in. So uh, this one would be L paren. I guess this would be R paren. And this would be L brace. And this would be R brace. This would be L bracket. R bracket. I could do a text transformation template, but eh, whatever. This is not that bad. Comma. Pound. I guess we need a couple more. Um, okay, that's it. And then we have to just fill in the corresponding characters. Okay, that's it for those. And then we have so this is either not or not EQ. Don't know why I'd get confused about that. Um, so that's either colon or colon assign. You know what, executive decision assign is way too long. It should be set. Okay. Um, take EQ. Uh, I'm expecting you guys to proofread for me because this is obviously fairly mindless work, although it, be, it will be over with lickety quick. So, toke XOR, otherwise, toke XOR set. Um, let's do the same thing. So, Oh, and I guess we actually got to some three wide cases. So let's not do those yet. So XOR mall mall set mod mod. And then for the three cases, we will have toke add, toke add set, toke ink. And we need how many of those? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Sub, subset deck and and set and and Okay, 
Let's see if that works. Fat chance of that. Action call with too few arguments. Okay. Let's just make sure those compile first. Did this really not? Did, oh, I think I set the compiler to lazy compilation, maybe. Otherwise, I would have expected to see that earlier. Oh, it's because the search and replace actually hit that. Okay. That's fine. Okay, let's just use a more specific pattern. Um, I love how this window here, so I'm, by the way, sometimes people wonder why my text is big. It's because even though I'm on 10, 1080p, I'm on a 14 inch laptop monitor. And I don't know how big this window looks to you, but this thing looks like an eye exam to me. And my eyesight is actually halfway decent. Um, and as far as I know, that thing is not resizable. It doesn't scale with any UI setting I could ever find. So uh, great design there. Median age of people who use MSVC in 2019 is probably like 53, so I'm sure their target audience is really appreciating the uh, the exercise for the the old eyes. Okay. Well, I guess that code wouldn't necessarily get exercised, but um, you can see we did in fact. Previously, we had this token hard coded. Now we should be able to do. Um, well, it should also be there should be an add plus, right? Yeah. So you can see that this thing here is recognizing the combined token. Previously, it would just have recognized those as distinct parts. Um, let's see. That looks reasonable to me. Obviously, this is totally untested, so we need to do some testing. Oh man, the back is killing me. Okay. Um, actually, one thing I want to look at, uh, this is premature, but uh, just to reassure myself and maybe you, I want to look at the code quality for this compared to the original, just to give an idea. And it's totally premature. You can't necessarily conclude all that much from it. But at the same time, um, I think it doesn't hurt to just take a take a gander to see what is being inlined and, and if there's any if there's any crazy loads because of aliasing not being able to uh, cache self.stir. The reason, if you look at a lot of the other functions here, um, I intentionally both for ease of typing and because just to help the compiler potentially if there's aliasing uh, concerns, uh, I cache off the stir at the beginning and then there's a single exit point and I synchronize it back at the end. Uh, I don't do that here because there's a mixture of functions that want to mutate it in place uh, and things that want to sort of access it up to date because, you know, they're just looping around. Um, and so I decided, at least unless there's a problem that we have to address, I'll just use self.stir internally, but then and, and these leap functions that have, you know, simpler control flow and can easily synchronize on entry and exit. Um, that's how I'll do it. But uh, anyway, let's let's try to get an idea of what's going on here. Sorry. Um. Yeah, this doesn't appear to be caching self.store the way I would hope it to. Um, uh, 
I would hope that after the inlining, it should be able to keep this thing in a... Well, I mean, it, it still needs to access the string, but I would expect the string pointer to be stored in a register, uh, which it doesn't look like because it's it's reading from this. Oh, maybe... this is Sorry, this is the top point. So that's probably fine. Um, right, okay. The thing we probably have to cache of anything is RCX if it doesn't do a good job of keeping that in... So RSI presumably is uh, so ninety six uh, ninety six okay so yeah RCX is that and so. It does the usual jump table stuff. So you can see it does an indirect jump based on, so this is what you would expect. The first character is invalid. Um, high on lex or error. That's fine. Um, don't want that to be in line for sure, because it's an exception. And so now it's back. It's reading the next character, which it has to. Um, and now it's doing white space, white space stuff. Um, and you can see it's incrementing the string pointer, putting it in RCX. It's putting it in ECX on X64. When you put stuff in ECX, it implicitly zero extends the high 32 bits in RCX. Um, Okay, I mean, it seems to be doing its best at keeping things in registers that should be in registers. So let me just make sure stuff got in line where I wanted it to. Uh, and specifically, let's look at our case functions because those are the potential uh, question marks. Not sure what happened here. Okay, so it actually even inlined, it, yeah, and that's what I would expect. It inlined next char, I guess because. There's no real, I mean, it's not a big deal either way, but there's no real reason not to inline all of the functions, even if they're big. And the reason is any anything that's lexing is going to hit all the different tokens with very high frequency. And so it's not the case that, you know, oh, you want to keep those out of line because 99% of the time it only uses one of these tokens. But you get you see basically all the token types very frequently, right, in a typical source code file. So there's no real point in hot cold splitting with this kind of code. Um, the stuff that's probably slower than it needs to be is using libc as digit. I should, I always meant to do that. I know some people who are following along in their own compiler replace them with their local equivalent. So we'll probably do that in the standard library maybe uh, once we do our versions of these functions or we'll, or we'll do some even more bespoke uh, lookup table versions for these things. Um, but now for now, let's just look at it. Okay, so that's all good. Let's actually look at those cases. So this looks pretty good. Where is this? I mean, what I want to see is Oh, that's pretty pretty darn clever. I'm not sure if you guys see what I'm seeing, but basically it factored out. Look at this jump target. So all of these different cases are actually using the same code. So it recognized, I guess because it's inline, I don't think it would do that with a macro. So that's actually a benefit. Um, well, maybe. I mean, there's an extra jump. Uh, maybe forcing it to actually inline separate instances would be better. But um, this is not bad either. A direct jump is pretty much free. Uh, it's perfectly predictable once, you're, uh, once it's in your uh, BTB. Um, 
no stalls at all in that case. But yeah, so it looks like it completely factored out that common denominator and all it's doing here is basically loading. I guess this is maybe not great because it can't use immediates for the comparisons, but uh, so maybe we, we do have to do something more manual to force it. Uh, but I mean, this is as a first approximation is not bad. Um, Yeah, so this is probably not great. That it, this factoring out is maybe a little bit too nice, if you will. Um, but anyway, yeah, it, 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 you, you can see that it, at least it didn't, just because we're using self.stir and stuff like that, it's not like the alias analysis uh, gave up and uh, did tons of spills uh, that it didn't need to do. Let me just make sure that I have my settings. Uh, just, I mean, I'm not going to dwell on this because without actually benchmarking properly, it's it's totally meaningless. But I, I I do like just looking at code like that just to see is it doing something totally unreasonable. It looks like it's doing things that are reasonable, but there's also some few cases that if you're micro optimizing, you'd probably want to take an extra look at. Um, Yeah, so it's still doing that tail sharing. All right, so, I mean, we should actually profile it. To me, the problem is not the jump, the problem potentially, oh, uh, I was looking at the wrong config. Okay, it was already set to that. Um, yeah, the only problem is by using that shared config, it had this sort of local calling convention, and so there's stuff that should just be in immediates that could uh, th that has to be loaded into registers in order to interoperate with that shared piece of code. Um, but um, anyway, it, it's not shitting its bed completely. That's we can work with this. So yeah, this is reasonable. Um, let's uh, let's actually. Uh, Try to print some more information to see whether those ranges are correct. Um, actually, let's do it formatted so we can see them aligned. Um, that is not what I meant to do. I also meant to go back to debug where everything is way faster. Um, so I mean, let's just eyeball some of these things to see whether they're uh, they're 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 on or off. The way we do the tracking is the same for all tokens. So if I confirm it to my satisfaction for a few tokens, I kind of accept it. So. Um, Zero is where this illegal character backtick starts. So this is zero. This is one. Uh, this is the new line, so it would be two, and it says it ends at five, so it's, this is two, three, four, five, so that looks right to me. Uh, let's just do another litmus test, so it's six, after one gap, it should be one, two, three, four, that should be ten, yeah, and it is. So, okay, so let's just say that works um, for the ranges, because they do the same logic for all of the, all of the cases. Um, they record the start, and then they calculate it at the end. You'll see one thing we do here is that we calculate we calculate how far we've progressed since we started lexing uh, using the difference between you know a, a, a pointer to the stream and the start pointer. Um, but we rebase it using the posts. And this is sort of my one conceit, I guess, to interoperability because we still want to have this idea of um, you know logical positions that are not necessarily local 
character offsets. Um, so once we do the multi-source stuff, uh, that that is taken into account, uh, and, and that's going to be fine. And uh, let me let me maybe write this actually just to emphasize that we're a post. Um, I think this would otherwise, since we're doing a pointer difference, which is a 64-bit quantity on 64-bit platforms. It might complain on some platforms. It probably is if I haven't even noticed it yet. Um, all right. So, yeah, in my opinion, this is substantially cleaned up from the last version. Um, no macros, but similar level of brevity. Um, maybe some code quality stuff, but I mean, you know, like the thing about code quality is that if, if it's sufficiently bad that it matters, you just go and write the nasty code, right? And you can maybe write a script to do it for you. But um, this to me uh, looks good. Obviously, this is minimally tested. Um, I'm actually not going to do much more testing right now. I'm going to trust that the original code, uh, if, if there's bugs, they're going to manifest once we get a little bit further. Um, and so even though this is kind of, I would say, unacceptable level of testing under normal circumstances, given that we're porting something and that I expect there to probably be some transliteration bugs, but even so, those are going to be uh, easier to find once we're doing real stuff because once I then do si see those bugs, I will have very high confidence that those are not due to intrinsic algorithmic issues. They're due to some stupid little transliteration thing and I will find them quickly. Otherwise, this would be way too much unknown, uncertain code to just trust without massive testing. But because this has had very extensive testing by now, the only bugs that are likely to exist are going to be in the manner of transliteration bugs, which are easily fixed when they arise. So. Um, someone's asking off topic how did you move the arch debug release toolbar up next to the menu i honestly don't remember how i did it i remember someone told me how to do it though and i don't yeah so okay i don't know how that crept back in someone told me how to do that um No, now you made me curious. I guess it's this one, right? Um, yeah, so you can see you can put it here in this command menu, which is pretty pretty weird. Um, and I think you can even put more up here. Like, uh, I guess, I don't really know what I normally use. I guess maybe debug. Um, I sometimes like to see, well, I guess when I'm debugging, I can always see, but anyway, you can actually add commands here. Like if I wanted to add this, you now have this button here. So yeah, someone told me about that because I was in, I didn't know you could do that until that person told me. So you can go and do that yourself now. It's a very nice, efficient use of real estate, especially when you're on a small laptop monitor. So I, I appreciate that. Um, all right. Okay, let me just get a swig of ye old Coke Zero. Then we will move to the parser, or the AST rather. Actually, before we do that, uh, th that's premature. Let's at least test that these functions are doing something reasonable uh, by just printing. Um, Okay, so post and then stir and then because you have length before stir for this case here. Um, for this, don't want to quote it. 
So um, we can still return it all. Let's see what this does. Yeah. So you can see this kind of looked reasonable. Maybe I will, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Just to align things visually. Sorry. Okay. Um, Anyway, so you can see this is pretty reasonable. This gives you the information you need. Um, and then some of the stuff we were previously doing integrated into the Lexer is going to move into the parser. And in the case of just kind of, uh, you know, very simple-minded consumers of the Lexer uh, into a few convenience functions that can manage interning and string pooling and line counting for you and, 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 and you know, printing of messages and stuff like that. But that's... That's what I think is the right design for us. Uh, and not a bad design even in general. Um, having the integrated interning is nice, but it requires the lecture to take on way more resource management responsibilities. And uh, so I, I do think this is the right right call. All right. Um, let's see. Maybe we do want to change one thing. Um, We think. The old interface, so this is another thing I kind of decided to change intentionally. In the old Lexer, you will note that I always pre-pumped it with next when I call init. I decided that I don't like that, and the reason is I don't want init to have side effects. Like, I want to be able to set up the struct and then call next the first time and I will start getting callbacks. The problem is if I call an ed and I start getting callbacks, that's kind of like doing two things that should be separate. Um, so it means that you always have to pump once uh, or the other way to think about it is that you actually want to do kind of this. Um, well, you don't have the comma operator, but if you did, you could do, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, we could do this. Let's just do that as a short-term convenience, and I, I won't depend on it um, in the parser anyway. But uh, makes it easy for consumers. So that you can do. Should look at the warnings. I guess I did reverse them. Look good to me, though. Oh, so it was complaining about. This is complaining about. Oh, and this is a correct complaint, I think. Um, because otherwise it's going to get passed. The only reason this didn't blow up previously was because of. I think alignment on the stack or something, or maybe because they're passing registers. So this is definitely a correct thing to complain about. Um, all right. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Let me think. 
we want to do something interstitially before the parser and the AST. Um, we probably should because we have to recognize identifiers. Actually, that's not true. Well, you have to you have to recognize keywords, so we actually do have to do something kind of interstitial. Um, so let's do that. Let's. Uh, easier to create new, new folders from here. Um, A lot of these files are going to be reorganized. I think, for example, you want the AST to be in the standalone, and you want a bunch of stuff at the shared top level module, ion module. Um, but anyway, let's do this and let's make a. Now that we have our fancy, uh, our fancy new boy here, we should just be able to. One thing that's specific to my workflow, which I didn't add to the project file, is that I always have to remember to add a reference, to, or not not a reference, that's not actually important, um, add, a add a build dependency on the compiler because, oh, I guess by virtue of doing the reference, that sorry, that did it. But uh, just so that uh, things compile in the right order. Otherwise, you can get, even aside from just being out of date or whatever, the problem is there can be build uh, race conditions where it's trying to use the XE file while it's being overwritten or something. So you can get uh, spurious, or not spurious, actual uh, legitimate uh, errors due to that uh, at random points in time, which is obviously not great. Okay. Um, um, I think we can do this, right? Let's copy the signature. Actually, let's copy all of this code just as a starting point for testing. Um, I guess his name is a little bit annoying. I mean, we could, I'm trying to remember, can we actually, does this actually work if you do? this. It should. That's obviously the intent, but I can't remember for sure if that actually works. Um, but this is a good time to test, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't. This is a bug, basically. Oh God, it's doing it again. Did you, do you see that? It's the S ion insanity. Let's close this thing before it blows everyone to smithereens. <laughs> That's an insane bug. It must be related to my project setup. Right? Uh, otherwise, I can't make sense of it. But I mean, I can't make sense of it regardless. Um, okay, so that file is still there. Where does it think? Where does it think this thing is?
Like this is some kind of ancient version of something. I have no idea why it thinks that's what I'm trying to build. Yeah, so you can't do that. That's what I thought. Um, I should fix this off stream. It's a little bit annoying. The reason this is annoying is normally this dot notation basically means you know, you're kind of subscripting some things or you're digging into the namespace of another thing. But in this case, this is sort of like a sub package of something. But um, I wonder if, uh, yeah. let's just import the symbols. There's actually not that many symbols, I guess. Um, Lexer init next, probably the only we need. Um, well, for testing, we need posts as well. But Just we need these things as well. Just to get us started. And then we will write some really want to be able to give it a name, but the problem is the noun name is so easily, well, okay, let's just do this. I guess this is the obvious thing to do. It's totally fine for now. Um, which has the benefit of actually working or should work. Uh, and then with things like this, I think we do want to import those certain things like posts. Um, these, these are not really, these don't really belong to Lexer. They just happen to be there for now. Um, Let's see if that still works. It's new home. Okay, so that works. Um, let's consider how to build a um, Um, let's consider how to build what we need on top of it. So we need to basically provide, um, and a lot of these things, again, the parser shouldn't really own. So maybe this is where we need to do some of the source base integration.
I think it's okay. Like if, if, if you're asked to parse a file, I mean, I guess that depends. If you want the ability to do piecemeal expression parsing, I don't think we really need to handle that. You can just, you can treat that as a string that you submit as a single source object for parsing. So we can, we can do it a little more heavyweight in the parser because we don't need to sort of use the parser as a function the way we do with Alexer. So I think it's okay to couple that to some heavier weight thing. Um, so for example, if you go back to the Lexer, I think you can take some of this stuff here. Um, you can just copy and paste it over. Probably. Well, it doesn't belong in the parser either, but it's going to be, for at least for now, closer connected to this. Um, so, um, one thing I decided changing after the other stream is that rather than calling it sources, which is four constants in a row and and just is not very descriptive. I'm going to call it a source base in the sense of a database. Um, so it's the database for managing. I think that's a very strong metaphor. It not only manages the storage of the data, but it supports queries, right? It's It handles queries. Right now we have simple queries like finding, you know, finding lines and things like that. Um, but will support AST queries. Once it has ASTs, you can ask, hey, what AST node is at this character, right? So you can use it just to do live queries and stuff like that, or you can just use it for generating error messages or whatever. Like, uh, uh, you know, say, say I want to generate a good error message and I want to find all references to a certain symbol to print to the user, you know, who answers that query? Well, the answer is the source base does. So it's a database for source. Um, and I'm even, I'm sort of thinking that it would be kind of cool just as a debugging tool and just for fun, if you had like a small little command line query language where you could add a prompt, you could, you know, when, when, when you're actively managing a live uh, source base, you can kind of ask, you know, like uh, almost like SQL for source code where you can ask queries about it. Like how many, um, you know, give me all the reference to these and it gives you a set of things. And then you can operate on it. Okay, now filter it down to this subset, like that kind of thing. Anyway, that's uh, not critical path, but I think the idea of having this kind of database-like system that manages everything uh, is not only useful for kind of internal use, but um, also as an external resource. So um, let's see here. So probably... Um, right, so we have this notion of post info, and this information can cannot be resolved standalone. It's only because of the data that the source base manages that we can get this info. Um, and so let's see here. So this is for uh, this is also an example of a function that should, uh, I guess it's an STD, stoop. This is going to be an allocator again. So Actually, you can copy the buffer directly. Now that I think about it, you should be able to do this. And then you don't need this because the type is inferred. Um, and in fact, it will also copy the line ending because yep. So we can just do this. Very nice. Um, so, boom, boom, boom. 
So now when we do stir dupe, we really want to put it into our own arena. So uh, first let's actually, before we start using that, let's remove some of the step code um, for arenas because I know that I put this in to be something unreasonably small. Um, and it should probably be closer to say 64K. You can make it even larger, but at a certain point, it doesn't matter all that much because we do, at least for now, the arena doubles every time it has to add another block. So it will discover the good size. You just want to kind of give it a starting boost, but um, th this is just kind of giving it a warm start towards finding the final size of the arena it's managing. Um, it's very likely that this will just be fixed block size grow, uh, fixed block size all the time uh, in the future. But this is just the implementation I did. The original arena we did was fixed block size. I think it did one megabyte blocks every single time. The nice thing about that is you never overestimate the space usage by more than at most one megabyte. Um, on the other hand, it means that you have to either start large or start small, and then it takes forever to comfort the allocation you need. Uh, too many allocations in that case. So this is good. At, this is good at this growth approach is good at finding the final size you need with a minimum number of allocations. But then when you found the final size, it's possible that you overestimated, or you almost certainly overestimated, and you're going to do it by a percentile, right, or a percentage. All right. So uh, let's do this. So so yeah, let's think about the uh, memory management. So the, the, the okay, the way we partitioned things so far, the Lexer has no memory management. It has no re resource ownership. It completely outsources that, and as a result, it can be used very easily standalone. Um, but it now means that we we do actually need to take ownership of things and manage things. So. Um, how are we going to manage that memory? I think the answer is we will have arena allocators um, and probably what we will do is, um, so let's, let's ask, uh, do we need more than one arena? Well, we need storage for uh, the intern pool. We need storage for the source code data. Um, we could definitely choose to um, use separate allocators for those two cases. Um, that's not a huge burden. I mean, it's a very, it's basically nothing, right? Um, so uh, what we can do for that is, let's see. I mean, you can say name alloc. Uh, source alloc. I mean, in general, you don't want to fragment your memory unless there's a good reason. I don't know if it makes sense. We can always reassign these to be, you know, uh, something else. Uh, the other thing we need is we need a, uh, we need a upstream allocator. So when you initialize a source base, you say, what allocator do you want to use? You can specify zero. That will always, zero always means use the default current allocator, uh, which you're generally not supposed to override. So it's something like malloc free, basically. Um, so someone gives us that and uh, we keep it around just for safekeeping so we can free the original uh, arenas with it. Um, but then we, the, the main thing we do with it after initialization is we pass it into these arena allocators. So these will sub allocate out of the upstream allocations. Um, and so even if we have malloc upstream, we will ask for things in big blocks, like you know, initially 64K and then eventually very much bigger than that. Uh, and they will sub allocate out of that to provide uh, both linearization of the memory so that, for example, if we're allocating names, all the names are going to be very tightly consecutive within each block. And since the blocks are pretty big, that means they're going to be kind of linear overall. And then for the source code, well, I mean, we're going to allocate every single file as a uh, solo block. Um, so it might actually make sense to uh, not use a source allocator for that uh, now that I think about it because each source file is going to be big enough that you probably just want to do an upstream allocation for each of them. No, actually let's not do that because then we have to manually free them and one of the nice things about having coarse grained allocation is that you have a coarse grained way of managing lifetimes as well. That's also why you don't want to fragment your arenas too much. Um,
let's do it like this. Let's make these pointers. Uh, and then the actual arena allocator itself will be, um, will be, you know, we need to have the header and stuff for that here. And so these will just be initialized to point to this. And then we, if we want to have them be separate later, we can do that. <clears throat> um, then we have a name map, something like this. Um, and so when we do source base init, um, you had just have to specify an allocator. And um, um, so we stick in that allocator for safekeeping. All, we don't have to zero, we don't have to initialize anything we don't want to. Um, Just remind myself of the signature. All right, okay, so let's just zero initialize, set, set a few fields and then zero initialize. Um, that's fine. And then we do the rest with um, name map init. Um, like that, and we specify our allocator, hook that up, and um, it has its own internal arena allocator from what I remember, so we actually don't need to pass that in. Right, it has its own internal arena allocator, so we don't even need to, to do that. Um, going to call this arena. So we initialize that. Um, and I guess for the other case we will do um, we will do it like this arena allocator allocator initialize the name map and then uh, we'll set up to, to just use the default arena. But I'm, I'm going to, let's see. Let's just call it like this. Because one of them is sort of to manage the headers and stuff, right? And this is the pointer. The, the reason it's a pointer, you want to have a pointer, is because anytime you're specifying uh, an allocator, you're always passing a pointer, and it's annoying to have to write ampersand every time, right? So you want to have a cached pointer. The other benefit of this is, again, if we have multiple versions of these pointers for different kinds of use cases, they can kind of alias the same arena allocator to start with, but then, and actually, let's make this just allocator, because we don't want to couple to the arena-ness. Um, And name in it, hook that up, looks good. Um, All oh, right, let's just do a bulk import. Uh, let's call it names. Okay, too few arguments. So um, we're going to call this self. So I'm going to call this like new source. Um, 
So we pass in some source code. Um, and we're going to use our allocator for that. This is the other thing. Um, our sources is going to be self sources is going to be a new self alloc. We're basically just hooking everything up to the allocator. Um, <clears throat> You're not going to see this a whole lot in general. Um, this is a little bit more noisy in terms of hooking up the allocators because it's kind of the root manager for a lot of the resources. Um, so you're, you're not going to see granular stuff like this all over the place. Um, but I made a somewhat conscious choice to not have too much implicit plumbing of allocators. Uh, right now, Scoped allocation is the kind of implicit plumbing. It has very well-defined semantics in terms of lifetime, but I don't encourage overriding sort of a, a scoped version of the global allocator, especially with stretchy buffs. It's a uh, a serious death trap because it does it, stretchy buffs do lazy allocation, so you don't actually know when they're going to see the allocator for the first time. The reason you do a new is exactly so that you can um, hook things up. So when you do a new, it installs a copy of this allocator in its header, and so at that point, it sort of it knows what it's attached to, and both what to use for allocating additional storage and what to use for freeing old storage. Um, so I mean, this is pretty easy. Once you have a bunch of stretchy buffs, you just do this anywhere in the code where you have self, uh, where you have a, a pointer to source base. You will make a new, new bunch of stuff. All right. Um, and so at this point, this a push, you know, will get supported by that. Um, okay, something like that. So all these things are now going to be queries on the source base. Um, even in this case, I'm going to start just doing this consistently. I think a lot of these cases, even if currently based on the current representation, they don't depend on, um, what do you call it? They don't depend on uh, something in the source base. I think they will over time. So uh, for a lot of these things, I'm going to just have the source base along for the ride, basically, um, as a parameter. So what is this thing? So this is for inserting a new line. Um, right. So this is going to be the callback function, basically, if you recall. I think the way this worked was um, let me try to remember. No, I, I guess this is not, this is not going to be, um, okay, maybe this is the right API. So calculate the source from the beginning. So right now we have a, a list of these lines. Um, let's actually make this an assert because I don't want you to actually depend on this feature. You're supposed to add everything if you query kind of out, like you're not supposed to add out of order basically. So I'm just going to make this an assert rather than um, something else. Um, the other thing we can do here is, um, let's see, right, so the stir gets hooked up to this. There's also lines, right? Um, the lines, we're going to do a new, uh, a new self alloc. Which hooks up uh, hooks up lines to the allocator.
Okay, so new, let's, let's say, source space, new source stir. Make a duplicate of it. Um, hook this up, give it a pseudo name. Register that new source here, return it, increment. Um, like this new star <clears throat> um, probably you want to be able to specify the name honestly We enter in that as well, right? Like because we don't assume that you're giving us ownership of that, so we just enter in it. Or not enter in it, we just duplicate it into our own storage. Um, let me split that up on multiple lines. We have to also allocate this thing itself into the allocator. But the good news is that the way things are written, um, even if you forget to hook up some of these points, you can see it's mostly just a matter of plumbing it through. So it's not like you have to change the structure of the code to be, uh, for example, statement oriented rather than expression oriented. Like you can, one reason I added a new rather than having the old a init is so that in a context like this, you don't have to have a separate init line. You can see in some cases like this, you do end up needing it. Um, well, maybe not needing it. Maybe I should just return, have a function that's like the new equivalent. But as much as possible for the common stuff like these ray buffers, you can just use this expression oriented style for plumbing stuff through and, and it doesn't really change the structure of your code. So you have to be explicit about it, but it's it's minimally intrusive given that it is explicit. Okay, let's see here. Uh, I passed, oh yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so I think that's right for that. Um, so then you can say source base posts. Um, and then we just do maybe like source at posts. Um, We're just doing a linear search right now because it's easy to replace and I don't want to even get distracted for a second by that. Uh, then for here you'll say uh, info at posts. Uh, Let's write some test code for that. Unfortunately, I think we deleted, or I deleted, I shouldn't say we when it's me, I'm who's deleting stuff. Um, I think we deleted uh, the, the case we had yesterday, or whatever, last time we, we looked at the source based stuff. So let's just recreate something along those lines. Um, oh, actually, let's. Um, so I think what you want to do. Um, 
is So let's just put it here. We'll reorganize the location later. Um, so when you now get this, it's going to actually be a pointer to the source. And then we can just do source base. Because we can't actually. Right now we're not using. You know what? There's not that many sources. Let's have back pointers. I'm going to, in general, try to uh, try to avoid back pointers. By the way, um, back pointers are like convenient, but they really start to infect your code base if you let them go everywhere. They're convenient. Um, however, um, the t the coupling is intentionally so tight here that I don't feel bad about it. Like. The, the source base is kind of the master of the universe. So it's not like pointing to your parent in an AST. It's more like pointing to to God itself. I don't know. You know, like it, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's not a it's not so much a parent pointer as the global context pointer. So another reason just to do it out of purely pragmatic reasons is that these get really big if you stow references to everyone that you might want to ever talk to. But, um, may, may, and maybe there'll be a better way to do this, but this this seems convenient uh, and, and not costly because there's not that many sources relative to say AST nodes or whatever. So um, you can just hook it up like this. You're already coupled to its lifetime very tightly anyway because you're using its allocator for everything. So let's just do that. Um, source space. What was it? Add line, source, source base, source position. Um, okay, so let's have a test lexer. Um, I'm going to have a source base. Um, we're just going to use the default allocator for now. Um, I'm going to add a new string. Um, which is this one. Actually, let's just test that, that all this stuff works because it's not very complicated code we just wrote, but there's, it's worth stepping through as always. So what was it saying here? Uh, function call with too few arguments. I guess we also have a name. So let's just attach this name to it. Expected char star got uint. This is an interesting case. Um, I think what you want to do is you actually want to pass a post. And then when you're doing this math here, um, to calculate the offset, you just have to calculate start. I think it's called start, right? Um, that makes more sense anyway. Doesn't mean we can't look at it. But that's okay. It's a little too much coupling to a specific string representation anyway. So, okay. Let's see what happens here. So... We're still using the arena allocator. It's just that the upstream allocator is the default allocator, which is totally reasonable. Like the whole point of sub-allocating is that you can start out with a generic system allocator and things will be fine from then on. So, okay, so we have this now. Um, let's 
then try uh, let's try making a lexer. We will initialize it on. In fact, we will refer to the source directly like this. Um, and I'm going to then hook it up to source online. Just set a breakpoint just so we can see what goes on. Uh, and then I will just do something like this. And actually, for the other functions, uh, no, we don't need to. Let's we'll take control of those in due course. Okay, so it never called into our dude. It's entirely possible that data did not get initialized correctly, so let's check that out. Or the arguments of the string and the name were wrong. I think that's probably the case, actually. Name first, then data. Okay, it's still not calling it. Um, so the breakpoint here in general, so we don't fall off. Okay, I don't know why that happens. It's my own fault for pressing F4, but or Alt F4. Um, step through this and actually I don't know why I didn't do that. I think I looked at the init but not the new source. So here's the name, here's the big source. Uh, now let's look at this thing. Okay, the stir dupe clearly didn't work. Um, neither did the name, so it's just sdub itself that's busted up. That's fine. Uh, One annoying thing is sometimes when you go to source code, it won't go back. Okay. Um, let's just put some, I guess the my array version of this is uh, it's totally broken. Um, let's try something else first, just to see if it makes a difference. Could be the arena allocator, but I don't think so. I mean, you would either get a protection fault or you would get um, or you know, it, it might clobber other memory, but not uh, itself. It should be fine. Okay, so the problem. Okay, OBS disconnected. Let me just see what 
how long I've been going, two hours. I'll go for at least 30 more minutes. And while I'm waiting for the stream to reconnect, I will, I will fix, I will fix that code. Sorry, just disconnected for a sec. Um, so yeah, the, the issue appears to be, let's see, ion.parser. Um, let's see if there's something. Let me fix that off stream. Um, boom, 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 boom. Okay. Okay, so now we have a copy of this string and we have a copy of the name. Okay, so now if we actually do run the whole thing, we should get a breakpoint, surely. Okay, so the position here is two. Why is this? triggering a fault. Oh, we didn't set up the user data. Um, so the offset should just be two because the start is the very first file. Um, so let's just say I trust that for now. Now when we do on name, um, we are, let's see, we get this and we're expected to return something. Um, so we have a source base, um, and we can just intern stuff with a source base. I get back a stable pointer. I assume this is the signature, but I don't honestly remember. All right, I haven't written that yet. So then we should be able to just say source space intern. Um, uh, source, source space. Um, stir len, just return that. Let's see if that works.
Now let's get in. It's probably a little bit deceptive that it sounds like a pure function. Invalid, right, so we have to pass the pointer to that. Okay. Um, okay, so that never got called because I didn't hook it up. Now we have this identifier, which is interned, so that's good. Now the other thing we need when we do source base init is that we need to intern the keywords at the earliest moment. Um, This is a little bit delicate because we want to have the same invariant we had before. Um, Did it not compile? <laughs> Doesn't look like there's, oh, it's because I have this turned on. Um, this looks good to me. So these are the, keywords um, I don't understand why it's not executing any iterations Oh, maybe it was, and I was just thought it didn't do anything. The first one should skip because it's we're using a sentinel value. Okay, so import yeah. Uh, what did it return? I 
didn't show anything. Okay, so it did do something there. Okay. Um, the thing you have to be very careful about here <coughs> is that the min block size can accommodate You can pass in zero. A lot of these arguments, again, are going to be uh, implicit arguments or uh, default arguments where you don't even have to write zero, zero, right? Like, but um, we're going to set them up so that they're always zero means get the default behavior, whatever that is. Because um, I've been working on the design in the background and everything, like I, I'm basically, if you examine a lot of these analogies between, uh, you know, compound initializers and function calls, you'll find that with the new design, which I haven't fully explained on stream yet, basically there's perfect consistency in terms of the way default zero values works and, and named, you know, named, named arguments are exactly like uh, named initializers and stuff like that. But anyway, so um, let's do the name map, in, name map init here. Um, and, and let's actually source base block size. Let's make this actually fairly large. Um, and the reason I want it to be large is that I, I really depend critically on the fact that um, Actually, let's, let's just bake in the fact that the first one is skipped and the other one, and now it has to be non-zero. It's a hard invariant. Um, um, I guess that's actually a waste. We don't actually have to do that. Um, okay, but let's let's do this uh, just to keep it together at least. Um, actually, sorry, this will not. Excuse me. This will be passed in. Most of the time, this would be, you know, we, once we have optional, again, <laughs> once we have optional parameters, th there won't be any usability cost to having to plumb this through. Um, hopefully. 
Um, and so now, well, first let's make sure, let's, let's run it to make sure that actually did happen as expected. Okay. Um, now what you can do, excuse me, is, um, This is more of an internal thing than a super public API, but uh, I don't want the parser to re reach into the guts of the source space. I'm going to use the, an interface for that. Um, but basically, uh, the idea is um, Actually, let's assert it at construction times. We don't have to assert it at this point. Um, okay. Um, and now. Basically, in the parser, they will have some internal is keyword thing that will use a cached version of those to detect whether something is a keyword. But for now, let's just do it um, sort of barehanded. So uh, let's replace this with something more substantial. So if we see an uh, if we see a name, we should now be able to say if toke um, uh, t name. Again, this is a little bit of implementation detail. This is only really for efficiency in the parser, not so much for public consumption, although you can certainly use it for that too if you're someone. Like basically the, the, the point about this is it not only makes a guarantee that it interns the keywords, it makes a guarantee that they're consecutive in memory and that nothing else is kind of interleaved with them that's a name. And hence, if you want to check whether a given pointer corresponds to a, a normal identifier or a keyword, you do an interval check. Excuse me. You do an interval check against these, um, and actually, it's a little bit different because uh, keywords start, keywords end. So you actually want to do this plus this. Actually, that doesn't really matter because you're not going to have interior pointers. But uh, let's call them this anyway, because conceptually that is what it is. It's a range. Um, it's a it, it's a pointer range. Um, and so now. Actually, let's let's make it an actual character range. Just to sort of promise what we imply. Um,
Okay, let's see how this goes. Okay, that's certainly correct. And so far as it goes, um, Let's keep this global so don't have to worry about weird alignment. Um, let's try something like this. Okay, so that's the idea. Of course, this is roughly zero testing, but let's at least test the, test the edge cases as we some white box testing just from knowing what keywords are first and last. So the last keyword is undeath. So we should at least test that as well. Yep, as you can see that works. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? I think I'm already at two and a half hours. Roughly two and a half hours. Okay, I think that's enough for now. Um, so we didn't really get to the AST part. Arguably, this is still part of what we considered the Lexer in the olden days. But I think we have a better setup for success now. And the Lexer is much more self-contained. It might actually be fun to do a quick example of... Um, like, because the Lexer is basically completely stateless now, um, you can just jump to an arbitrary position. Um, like, what's a good example? You can just... See if that makes sense. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that makes sense. So basically, the point is the only state now that's sort of intrinsic to the lexer is the actual stream position, uh, and you can random set you can set that randomly however you want. So this means that if we uh, if we're going to use the lexer for going back and figuring stuff out later uh, by storing these very thin references that are just like indices into the stream, we can do that and there won't be any weird state interference. Um, we can just construct a one-off lexer to point into something and get what we need and get out. All right, so I think that's it for today. Um, I will work more on this and um, should have more time to work on it now. The last few days I was also dealing with compiler bugs and my weird uh, my, my weird uh, pain thing, but uh, it seems to be doing better now. So um, let's see, what do we need to do from here before we can work on the parser proper? I think we're mostly ready for the parser. We need a few convenience functions like expect and so on. Um, the parser is not going to interact very, uh, is not really going to interact very directly with the lexer um, for the most part. The parser is basically going to have a lexer, a current lexer. And um, and unlike the lexer, I'm going to, well, let me think about that. No, I'm actually not going to couple the parser to, um, to the source space. I think what we're going to do in terms of coupling and decoupling is we are going to have a similar kind of interface where there's a few things you fill in. Um, you provide an allocator. So first of all, the parser is going to manage memory for itself. That's just a given because I want it to allocate AST nodes, I think. Maybe we don't even want the parser to do that. 
maybe we just give them an allocation, an allocator, and can sub allocate out of that. Because right now, like, let's look at our current parser. Let's just glance at it. I have a bunch of things to say that I've been thinking about in the background about the AST structure. A lot of what I've been doing so far is actually to set up a better way of doing that. But if you look at our current code for the parser, it has a lexer, and that's the main state that's sort of meaningful is that uh, it, it, it does that. But then other than that, you know, the primary purpose of parsing is, is to really the, the purpose is to produce the, uh, the AST. And producing the AST uh, entails doing stuff with, uh, you know, allocating AST nodes. So like new type spec, whatever. Um, once it's found, once it's parsed what it needs, it will go and um, it will go and do that. And I think what we did here is we had an AST arena, and it was of course global, like everything else is global. Um, it might be worth thinking about. So this is something I thought about it might be worth thinking about having the ability to do a parsing pass without allocating um, which shouldn't be a big issue except for two cases so one of the nice things about a ll1 parser is that the parsing doesn't have to look at the results of parsing once you've you know once you've looked at the look ahead token you're going to either do something or fail basically um, like the look ahead decide the look ahead decides the only course of action, and maybe you fail trying to take that action, but there's no plan B basically. Uh, there's no backtracking either local or global, only look ahead by one token. However, there is there is almost there's pretty much one exception to that, um, which is this, and this is to deal with a fact that there's there's a small part of the grammar that's not technically L one. Uh, technically, it parses a slight superset um, of LL1. Um, however, it's actually not a problem because we just have to validate this doing resolution rather than in the parser. So basically, what that means. So, so let me let me show you the parsing thing I'm talking about. Um, if you have a statement that looks like this, um, so imagine the parser uh, cursor is here; it's trying to parse the statement. So it doesn't it doesn't know that it's dealing with an assignment statement yet, right? Uh, if if you see something that starts with a keyword like if or for or while or switch, you know what comes next. But basically. You don't know exactly what comes next if you don't see any of the above. And so in the else case, it basically parses an expression. And then after it's parsed the expression, it then has to see what comes next to see what, what actually is, is going on. And so, for example, if you just have a function call, this is just what's called a, a, a simple expression statement where, you know, you parse the expression and then there's nothing left. Uh, and so, okay, this is just a simple statement expression, um, expression statement. Uh, rather, uh, but in cases like like this, after it's parsed the expression, it then sees an operator that's not part of the expression, so it stops, and then the statement parser will see, okay, I parsed an expression, and then I pa pa pass, uh, parsed. Uh, now I can see my logahead token says it's an equality sign, so now I expect another expression before I'm done, and I'm going to say I'm assign the statement. Now, in the case of initialization, that is not the case, because with initialization. What you have is, well, it depends on what you define as being syntactically legal and what, what you define as being semantically legal. Um, there is no way to parse this if you require that this has to be a name. So it can't be, you know, like this, for example. It has to be a name. Then there is no way to parse this with L1 without using left factorization that kind of ruins the natural grammatical structure. Uh, so what I do instead is I technically parse a superset. I, I parse an expression, and then I validate that I had parsed. And then if I see this uh, token afterwards, I then validate that the thing I parsed was actually a name. Um, 
And that's the only case where I ever need to look at the AST nodes after parsing it to see what it was. Um, every other case, all I do with the results of recursive parses is to plug them into other new nodes. Um, and that actually means that except for this case, all the other cases are trivially uh, something you can deal with by, um, what you call it, by uh, by just kind of forwarding the nodes, as it were. And if they're null, they're null. That's okay. Um, so I may actually do the same thing. I may actually change this a little bit and move this from uh, syntactic parsing to resolution. So basically then init statements become just like assignment statements, like it's the same syntactic uh, allowance. You can have syntactically at that level of the syntax, you can have any expression. So this is syntactically legal, but then it's just going to get rejected in parsing. And that's basically what this is already doing. It's just, uh, you know, this is the one exception to ll oneness. So I feel like just saying that this is a sort of a semantic guarantee is, uh, it doesn't really make, you know, it, it's, uh, it means that there's a little more degree of freedom in the AST than could actually be, like you could, you could constrain it more syntactically um, by, by checking this here, but it's going to get checked in resolution anyway, so it doesn't matter. And furthermore, there's lots of other things syntactically we don't check, right? Like, for example, we don't check that variable, I, uh, that, that, you know, all these non-context-free properties, like do, do, does every variable refer to uh, a bound identifier or whatever? Like, there's all kinds of non-local things we don't check syntactically. So I think what we're going to change in the new parser is we're going to get rid of all these constraints. Um, or maybe not. Let me think about it. So, um, so this is in its statement. Yeah, it gets even sillier when you're talking about just plain colon, which has the same constraint. I mean, the, the the thing, the way you could handle this specifically is also that you could just return the kind rather than heap allocate. You know, but eh, that's. A bad smell. Um, I mean, yeah, all these things in theory could be accommodated, but no, this feels wrong. I think the bigger reason to not do this um, the way I was contemplating evilly is that there are certain kinds of errors you really can't generate if you can't reference other stuff you've already parsed. Because if you don't have persistent nodes, it means you can't point to the left child of a binary operator and say, this guy is the problem. You know, like this, this one has the wrong, well, and you need this anyway in resolution. So the, the case where I was contemplating using this was for like, maybe there's a better way to get the same thing. Let me think about it. <clears throat> Basically, I was hoping that you could do super fast syntax checking without having to um, without having to allocate stuff. Um, our allocation is still going to be fast relatively speaking, but you know like even after some of the AST compression tricks I have planned, we're probably going to have at least a six to one ratio between text and AST data. So if you have a megabyte of source, you have six megabytes of AST. That's not terrible. One megabyte of source is roughly, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, that's not too bad. I think we're just going to do it. And I, I imagine that a lot of IDEs will want to do something with the AST if this parse succeeds anyway. Uh, um, so. Okay, just a false, false hope, false stream. I don't think it makes sense, even if we didn't have this issue uh, and didn't want to clean things up at this phase with the, those errors. I think it, it would make error reporting in the parser itself more annoying. So let's not even let's not even try that. So yeah, I think the main thing is just we're going to have the new AST. Um, the all allocation is going to come out of some arena. Um, I think the source base is going to own the nodes. 
So the allocator will basically be, you, you will get the allocator um, from the source base. Um, again, one potential downside of this is there's no way, there's not going to be a way to, to instantiate a completely standalone parser. Um, no, that's not true. We can do that. We just make the interface pluggable in the same way. I think that's fine. So basically what you do is you have similar kinds of callbacks for doing allocations of AST nodes, and you have similar kinds of functions for reporting errors. And I think that's it. So you don't even pass in an allocator, you just pass in a function to actually do allocation. That's a little bit cleaner. So you don't couple to that specific interface. I think that's probably the way to do it. Um, and then again, you have a simple wrapper in the case where you want to just use it standalone, you can just hook it up to the default allocator and it will just do its thing. The other thing you want to do, the other reason you want to sort of do it in the source space like this is you want to not just allocate the nodes, but I think you want to make, keep a list of them. So the arena sort of implicitly just has everything concatenated. Um, but I think you want an index of all the nodes in the system. So that, for example, uh, one thing I have planned with the source manager is the idea of file versions, or just source versions in general. So imagine you have a persistent process that's like just sitting there, and you can issue queries to it. And it can get updates, either from just watching the file system for changes, or because an ID is pushing it changes without round tripping through the file system. Um, in cases like that, you want to be able to, remain, to retain previous versions of stuff rather than just overwriting it, but you have to be able to clean up, um, you want to be able to clean stuff up, right? So I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to at least localize some of the storage on a per file basis so that we can easily discard it when we need to kill an old version. Like this is not the biggest deal in the world, but I don't think it really costs us to do that anything to do that. So like each source in the source space is going to have um, like AST nodes that have been parsed and associated with it and also resolved AST nodes and so on. Um, so that we move the ownership up there. Uh, it's, it's owned by the source space, not really by the file, but it's associated with a specific source file. And so that way we can kind of cut out the piece uh, we, we want to throw away, maybe. That might be worth doing. Um, because, like, think of it this way. Every time we reparse, uh, it, depending on how much we have to reparse, if we do incremental reparses, but, like, given that the AST, uh, and then once you add in the type information and stuff for the resolver, it ends up being a lot of data. If you want that thing to be a live process, it can easily accumulate a ton of junk. So it would be nice to segregate it. But anyway, I'll think about that more offline. But that's the kind of stuff we're going to do next. The parser itself, just like the Lexer, is not actually going to change what it does. Actually, the main, the main thing I have planned is we're going to do much better error recovery and error reporting. Um, so I have, I think, some very simple ideas for drastically improving it. Just to give you a taster, the kind of thing I'm talking about is... Um, going to help for both syntax recovery and also s sort of semantic recovery. So basically, because we do lazy resolution in the resolver, and we're going to do that in the new compiler as well, um, we only really care about types for things. Like, we only care about resolving things that we are actually, that, that are on the critical path, like something we depend on. Now, under normal circumstances, we do force resolve all kinds of stuff just in order to catch uh, compile errors as early as possible. But you can easily just say, hey, if you're just doing a force resolve of something, and if it's marked bad because we failed parsing of it, then we don't force resolve it. We, of course, we report the syntax error, whatever was the original cause of that error. Um, but the point is there's all kinds of stuff we can easily recover from because we do out of order resolving, lazy resolving. And so as long as something actually doesn't depend on something, we can we can skip it. Um, and the other thing is, if you think about it, um, it take functions. So probably functions are the 99% case where you have an error that's, uh, that, that you want to recover from. Um, and we're going to be 
probably looking at two kinds of recovery, but let's talk about the coarsest and simplest and probably most effective. Suppose that if you see an error anywhere in a function, whether it's in a statement or a, a, an expression, or whether even it's not even in the parsing phase, but in the, in the resolving phase, as long as we have a signature a type for a function, we don't actually care. Like we can do everything else because from the outside world, the only thing other people care about is what is your type signature so I can do type checking against it. So you can do really good recovery from errors and functions without really shitting on the rest of the code because the rest of the code only cares about the signature. It does not care about the body of the function. So even if the body of the function is complete garbage, you need zero information from the body of a function. That's the simplest case. In other cases, like uh, like struct definitions and um, uh, variable de definitions with inferred type, where um, you know there's an error in the expression that, de that that would tell you the type it has, and so on. In cases like that, um, you know maybe you mark the entire declaration bad, and at that point, if anyone references it, you can't really proceed. Um, but but even for stuff like functions, even if the functions themselves are referenced, you can actually do everything continuing just fine. So anyway, I have a bunch of ideas along these lines planned. I think they will require very, very small changes to the existing code and will give you a lot of error recovery. Um, we will probably also do uh, statement level recovery because we have a semicolon based language. It's very easy to synchronize the semicolons uh, if you have a parse error. But, um, you know, the thing about statement level recovery in general is that it tends to require a lot more heuristic filtering because once you have one error inside a function, the later, uh, there tends to be other errors that are kind of second order uh, effects. And so you have to be a little bit more, um, you have to do a lot more tuning in terms of how many errors to report per function and what if they're related to the same variable or whatever. But uh, so we, so th th we might do that um, later or a little more, a little less more simply, but I think the big payoff is going to be declaration level recovery because that's both easy and very effective. All right. Anyway, enough rambling. That's it for me. Uh, I will be back. What day is it today? I guess it's Friday, actually. So I guess I'll be back on Monday. That gives me a lot of time to think about design stuff, um, which, I, which is what I've been spending most of my time on with the compiler off, off stream. It's just thinking about design stuff. I'm thinking about a lot of stuff we haven't gotten to yet. The stuff we were dealing with so far is sort of on the easier end of the spectrum. So most of my brain cycles have been going towards the type resolver, the back end uh, interface, and stuff like that because that needs to change drastically from what we're doing right now. So anyway, that's it for me. Have a good weekend. I will be back on Monday, and we will get into the parser properly at that point, I promise. Okay.